Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Bill. Every September, we do a uh, uh, cryptology and review talk. And the uh, normally, this would include a key signing. Uh, for obvious reasons, we won't be standing in a circle and handing each other documents tonight. And that's okay. And I will explain why that's okay. Now, let me hit the... Yeah, you're full screen now. Let me yep. check. And, and I will hit the follow me just to be sure. Yeah. There we go. We've got the follow me. I'm going to mute everyone except Bill. Thank you, sir. Well, folks can use the uh, raise hand or the chat to uh, get my attention. Or manually unmute themselves. So, once again, this year there will be no Web of Trust key signing. Uh, and we might not do that again. We'll see. The agenda tonight is the last year's cryptology news. I'm not covering all the security problems of the last year. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, either Internet Storm Center or uh, Bruce Schneer's feed, you can see things as they eventuate. Uh, I'm only looking at the cryptographic ones. I'm not looking at crypto coins or crypto coins or Ponzi schemes. I've ranted about that before. I'll probably rant about that again, but today is not that day. We'll discuss why you shouldn't use PGP, probably, unless you're a Debian developer, uh, and what you maybe should use instead. Lots of alternatives. We'll look at the year 2021 as a number, and we will do the usual history couple of new history items available and hey, yeah bill yo i'm uh, checking youtube uh, it's not showing you slides it's just showing your br and the green circle well that's the same for the uh for the jitsi meeting too it's just showing br it's not showing the slides right. well that's not good um i will try resharing the um, okay, and let's go to my desktop. I, I don't see it on YouTube yet, but there might be a guy right before it shows up. Maybe follow me is a problem after I do the trick to put myself in the corner. Yeah, the slides went away again. It's telling me that I'm in the corner of the slide. Am I not in the corner of the slide? There is no slide. Aw. They had... Um, oh, they had allowed us to have the person in the corner... Uh, in what you call conference mode. That is really annoying. Okay. Well, you don't need to see my face. And that's okay. Um... Unfortunately, it's still not showing the slides on YouTube. Give it a moment. It should be back now. Okay. A little more than a moment. I hear my volume on. No, I wasn't expecting this year's topic to be a continuation of last year's. I thought we'd 
finish that historic um, vignette, but a um, late breaking item in IEEE Spectrum last month gave the other half of the Rubicon Minerva scandal. So, okay, we'll pick up where we left off. It's not catching up on YouTube. It's still just showing your BR in the green circle. That is... not sharing on Jitsi either. What it tells me I am. I'm, I'm seeing your slides on Jitsi in my uh, web browser window. But the YouTube stream is still uh, it's not showing you slides on the YouTube stream. That's probably a problem with whatever's doing the streaming then. Now, what I'm seeing on Jitsi is uh, the PR icon. Well, it's reporting to me that I'm sharing slides. And I've unclicked and reclicked everyone follows me without sticking myself in the corner this time. Are you seeing are you seeing slides on Jitsi now? I'm I'm seeing the slides on Jitsi. Okay. I'm not seeing them on YouTube. I'm not seeing them on Jitsi. Well, if Jerry isn't seeing them on Jitsi. That's why it's not going to YouTube. Jerry, um, how about you turn your camera off and see if that gives you enough bandwidth that uh, you receive the screen? Well, I've got my camera off, and I'm not seeing the slides either, and I'm on Jitsi. Yeah, I, I'm i seeing that uh, you've lost connection. You're seeing that I've lost connection? Or yeah, you if I look at the left corner, it says you've got co connection lost. <laughs> but you can hear me. When I, yeah, when I look at it, I'm seeing the green thing. It says that's actually good. Bill, why don't you exit Jitsi and bring it back up? It's uh, psychotic. Sure, I can I can exit and come back in. I'm, I'm seeing Bill's really connected just fine. Well, now he's disconnected. I don't think the problem was Bill. I think the problem was you, Jerry. I think so too, but I'm willing to try. Can you now see my face? To, uh, I see everything. You're back to uh, connection good. I'm seeing Bill's face on YouTube. Okay. That's that's an improvement. You want to share your slides again? Yep. Ah, oh, slides. Got the slides. Probably like 30 seconds or so before it appears on YouTube. Okay, Bill's face again. So, ah, now I see the slides. Are slides, slides are on YouTube? Yep. Okay. So, the short news, the... SolarWinds supply chain hack bypassed multi-factor by forging a multi-factor cookie. They stole the integration secret key. 
stealing the key isn't really a cryptographic hack, but it's a standard technique in cryptanalysis, sort of considered cheating, but it works. The interesting historical news, the final Zodiac serial killer uh, taunt the media and the cops um, cipher uh, was cracked with computer assistance this last year. Uh, you can get full details on that on YouTube. And all the links will be in a separate links document that's easier to get it out of than the PDF or the presentation. Um, we'll make that available uh, to put on the uh, historical calendar. Uh, the Spectre meltdown continues to abuse the micro-op cache. Uh, this is relevant in a cryptology review because it's uh, it can leak your key bits uh, if you're you know sharing a cloud processor. There are a couple of exciting papers that got the cryptology academic community all in a tizzy uh, that blew over like a storm in a teacup. Somebody claimed that they uh, could break uh, 18th and 19th century ciphers with quantum computing. Uh, and other people who were working with IBM qubit hardware said that... Uh, well, the stability on the hardware is so poor that we can't actually do anything, so it seems unlikely. And given that you can break it without quantum, uh, what's? why should we care? Uh, another one uh, claimed a major uh, breakthrough in factoring without quantum. Uh, and he's revised the paper several times, and in fact, it's not so different from his paper of 10 years ago. And the community, after rushing to read the paper uh, and discuss it, has basically yawned and said, yeah, this doesn't change anything. So RSA is still just as good or just as bad as it ever was. Now, we're not doing a PGP key signing. Why might we not do one when we can get back together again? There's no longer any use case for PGP where it's the best tool, except uh, Debian still requires it for you to submit to uh, Debian uploads. Uh, and even they have an alternate uh, trust route for uh, rather than using the web of trust that the key signing requires. So um, is, is there a reason to do a key signing? Maybe not. And there's plenty of argument that other uses of PGP should have stopped several years ago. So it has been very much demonstrated that the public key servers aren't trustworthy, unfortunately. Why the hate? The math is still fine. <clears throat> but having one tool to solve all problems... Uh, resulted in terrible user experience. And this is why your banker and your HR department uh, will not use PGP to send you a secure email. They'll use um, some propriety corporate thing that annoys the heck out of you. I can't give you one answer to what you should replace PGP with because it depends on A, what you want to do, and B, what you don't want to have happen when you do it. Uh, are you hiding your emails from your boss, from Chinese Secret Service, Russian Secret Service, the FBI, the IRS, a uh, reporter with the Boston Globe? Who are you hiding from? Um... For a lot of people, the soon-to-be ex-wife's lawyer is who you should be hiding from. That's a very different use case than hiding from China. Unlike when PGP was created, 
uh, the internet largely delivers immediately and things are point to point uh, with secure delivery. It's only insecure when sitting in your Gmail folder waiting for you to look at it. And, well, Gmail was going to decrypt it before they displayed it to you anyway, so... The, uh, the world has changed. Now, what PGP did was it created an attachment which was an encrypted blob that was a replacement body for the message. Um, there are many other ways of uh, encrypting an attachment. They don't have that nice little plug-in uh, to stuff them in <coughs> and make it appear to be the body of the message when you read it. But, yes, John, I know. We mentioned that with Debian at the top of the uh, deck, and we'll get back to it. Trust me. The um, Keybase was a uh, popular option for a couple of years, but they just got bought by Zoom, which is hosted in China and has... Uh, Chinese owners, and uh, depending on your threat model, that might be a problem. Magic Wormhole is interesting. Um, it only works simultaneously, which works on the modern net where most people are connected all the time as opposed to needing store and forward. So a weak horse stapler type password uh, that is used simultaneously has uh, a greater strength than if it was uh, testable offline. Um, quite, quite intriguing. Uh, most of the recommended replacements uh, are, well, if you want to do secure things, don't use a store and forward protocol which is what email is. Um, you, If you want secure chat, use a secure chat application. And again, Keybase was an option. Maybe not so much. Um, I really like this uh, tweet from a couple of years ago, so I'll rerun it again. Stop making fun of different end-to-end -end encrypted tools. Signal is hardened. WhatsApp is popular. OTR is flexible. Wire is beautiful. PGP. And Threema lets you talk to Europeans. Uh, NACL, which is the chemical formula for salt, but it's the uh, network cryptography library. I forget what the A stands for. I don't care. Um, have, there are two versions that do secure data blobs, think of a tar file, think of any single file, um, and is designed to be less prone to user failure than PGP. Um, alas, Keybase was the leading implementer. Um, Eureka is a symmetric file encryptor, mentioned magic wormhole. Um, The alternatives to a public key server that was getting hacked, well, Keybase, yeah, they were sold to Zoom. Mm. Um, and then there's, you know, just putting your key hash or your key, if it's small enough, when the elliptical curve ones are, uh, and your SIG. Okay, I don't like that, but it's possible. Um, or you can use that end-to-end -end secure chat application to send the passphrase um, out of band. Hey, okay, that, that works. Um, but we, we, we need something that makes that safer. For signing software, that's the last use case for GPG, PGP, which means Debian. Um, they've replaced the web of trust. They still use GPG for the uploads. BSD has abandoned it. They have Signify and MiniSign. Maybe Debian will follow suit eventually. 
for other uses other than those mandated by Debian, uh, the update framework notary service uh, is, is a way to prove that a file existed in this form at a certain time. And there are other notary services on the web. And that's uh, and those those will handle the other, those other use cases where, where you're trying to provide uh, evidence. Okay, crypto history. Uh, those of you that saw my chalk talk years ago when I first did this, I discussed uh, classical and modern cryptography with the transitional mechanical phase in between paper and the stored program computers. Lately, we've been talking about a post-quantum cryptography uh, in Rosy Tomorrow, which is, you know, several years in the future and has been for several years. This is better than 20 years in the future for fusion power, which has been 20 years in the future for 40 years, uh, but it still isn't here yet. Uh, and calling it post-quantum is better than calling it post-modern, I guess. Uh, so we, we know that classical is anything with pencils and modern is anything with general purpose computers. Uh, transitional included the Enigma, other rotor machines, pinwheel machines that look like rotors but aren't rotors because they have pins sticking out the edges instead of pins sticking out the side. Um, and the... Uh, early discrete digital hardware that we spoke of uh, last year. This year we'll be talking about reinjection rotors and other um, advanced rotor systems that were uh, the last of uh, that technology in the Enigma Type X Sigaba um, family uh, before it was completely abandoned. Uh, I will repeat last year's slide on quantum. Uh, quantum cryptography, post-quantum cryptography is talking about mostly not using quantum technology for protection, but protecting your cryptography uh, from being attacked with uh, the opponent having a quantum computer that can decode all keys simultaneously or something. Uh, and, you know, if you get a big enough quantum computer, you can factor RSA primes immediately. Uh, so that this is a reasonable thing to be concerned about. The N NIST, which is what the National Bureau of Standards calls itself these days, uh, has uh, a competition like they had with uh, AES encryption like they had with the latest uh, hashing function for uh, new cryptographies that will be resistant against uh, quantum cryptanalysis. Uh, dilithium crystals is one of the candidates. Gotta love the name. Um, and uh, Michaelis and Frodo are two of the others that uh, Germany has chosen. Um, the, and switching to post-quantum cryptographic primitives as soon as possible is a good idea if you're worried about anybody saving your messages until they can afford a quantum computer to crack them. It is generally assumed that NSA's Colorado Data Center is the world's largest collection of solid state drives um, keeping a copy of everything they've hoovered up in case they figure out how to crack it later. Uh, so yeah, um, this uh, might be a good thing. Anyway, there's no, inform no new information on this slide, just a reminder that you needn't be panicked about quantum yet, but be glad somebody's working on quantum. Our current year is the product of two near equal size primes, which is exactly how RSA moduli are built. Um, 2021 is 43 times 47, which is 45 plus or minus 2. 
as it happens, both the Hagelin pinwheel machines uh, and the Tunney pinwheel machines, uh, which are like rotors, but are we, we can distinguish them from rotors. Um, the pinwheels are the ones that have wheels of different size so that they combine uh, in nice mathematical ways as opposed to the ones that work like odometers, which are your classic rotors. Um, and it was 41, not 43, uh, factor that broke the tunny when it was plotted on a 25 by 23 and it made a diagonal line. But here, here are the... Uh, wheel sizes for the uh, Hagelin C52 and the uh, Tunney Lorenz. Uh, and here is a rig demo. I've used Raku, which is what Pearl 6 is called these days, um, to check the factors of those wheel sizes. 43 and 47 are prime. The um, C52 had a number of wheels that had small primes multi multiplied by 2 to get a 46, or 2 times 37 for 34, because having a wheel that was as small as 17 would be silly, but this lets you use these small primes. But the factor of two isn't going to keep them from having co-periods. Whereas the uh, Tunney or Lorenz SC42 um, used almost all primes except for 3 times 17 and 2 times 13. So they are truly co-prime. So that's our numerology for the year. New declassification in the last year, the final... Uh, textbook from the NSA's 1970s new cryptologist class was declassified, redacted somewhat, on Freedom of Information Act request. This was a major update to William Friedman's Part 3 textbook. It deals with non-periodic substitution systems, which are approximately what these rotor machines are. The rotor machines are actually periodic but with a period so long that if you're going to break them, you have to treat them like aperiodic systems sometimes. Well, as demonstrated with that diagonal line on the 25 by 23 grid, uh, sometimes you can break them as a periodic. But if they're using it right, not. Um, several sections are still redacted. The uh, 1977's training on auto key systems, long and continuous keys, geared disks, key analysis, crypto diagnoses, and depth reading all had large sections that were considered still too sensitive to release to the general public. Even though we sort of have to assume uh, the Russians have figured out most of that, well, we don't want to give it away to smaller countries. And we definitely don't want to let the academics know about it. Um, but the sections on interrupting keys are interesting. And it has actually a uh, uh, fairly decent discussion of the uh, uh, World War II strip system that was equivalent to the uh, Jefferson's cylinder system uh, that was used for medium level uh, strategic and uh, tactical messages uh, throughout World War II, uh, and they discuss uh, how to break the uh, original form of it and why it was uh, restructured more securely. Uh, and it's uh, delightful that they include in the textbook how to break a former U.S. system that was actually used uh, in actual war. Uh, re really kind of neat. I'd seen discussions of how the Germans broke it in the Tycom paperclip documents and some high-level discussions, but this is right there in the textbook, teaching students how to do it 
and uh, giving them problems in the back of the book that they're expected to break in class or in the classroom after class because you can't take your homework home if you're studying at the NSA. New historical resources, uh, Dermot Turing, a uh, nephew of Alan Turing, uh, whom John spoke about a couple months ago, um, has two books out uh, and has been leaving uh, videos all over YouTube as he's uh, been guest speaker where he makes sure to um, redress the historic balance. Um, Uncle Alan did an awful lot of wonderful stuff, but the early books, which were working in a only partially declassified environment, um, gave Alan credit for things that other people did. Um, and the classified world couldn't then correct the academic historical record uh, to properly differentiate what Alan Turing and his friends at Bletchley did separately between the several departments uh, versus what the Poles did before they did the handoff um, versus uh, what the Colossus team did, which was mostly a separate team from the Enigma team. There was some movement of uh, research people back and forth. Um, and yes, you know, the Colossus side, which is more the origin of modern computing, even though Alan Turing had the theoretical basis with the Turing machine uh, for considering that a universal general purpose computer would be possible. Um, so it, it's uh, nice of Dermot to uh, share credit. Uh, while the, we, the public, wanted a uh, retrospective knighting of uh, Alan Turing, they, they gave the knighthood to Dermot. Well, oh, well, that, that's how the monarchy works, I guess. He's making good use of it. So, transitional cryptography. We mentioned that... Uh, the rotors and the pinwheels in electromechanical settings that were sort of similar to adding machines and odometers, um, but with rat's nest wiring inside for the rotors or with combinatorials uh, circuits uh, for the pinwheels were transitional uh, between the pencil and paper era and the true electronic era uh, and general purpose computing after that and modern. The uh, Enigma was the earliest practical of the rotor machines uh, based on what they knew about Enigma both the British and the Americans came up with better rotor machines as did the Japanese uh, and the, uh, but they were still the same basic principles and had, had the sort of innovations that the Germans added to late model enigmas. Uh, but after World War II, the, um, the, uh, Army rolled out new machines um, based on a principle discovered in 1944 where you take some output pins from your waterfall of rotors, each of which has a rat's nest encipherment, um, Thank you, Jerry. Um, and feed it back in another input. This means you have to have more inputs and more outputs than the number of symbols that you're encoding and ciphering. Um, which, you know, initially Enigma had 26 inputs, 26 outputs, 26 
pins on each side of each rotor, and that was just enough for the letters in the alphabet. Not enough if you're Cyrillic, more than enough if you're some of the European alphabets that don't quite get to 26, but that's what they were using. It also meant they didn't get to do their accents or umlauts, but the um, so the, this is running it through twice. Now, the, the Enigma ran it through twice in one sense, and then it reflected back through the same stack, um, which caused one minor problem in that the letter E could never encipher itself so that you could guess where a word was by where there wasn't an E. Where there wasn't an E is where there might be an E in what they've enciphered. Uh, this was helpful for cribbing. But um, th this is re-injecting from the input side uh, in addition to or in lieu of reflection. And here you have a picture of it going through three times through the red wires. And that's, uh, that increases the scramble. And we have a weather alert. Thank you. The, um, if that's a tornado warning for Boston, somebody let me know. The, uh, the, the this is, you know, sort of in retrospect, obvious, but brilliant to see it the first time. The, um, I'm inferring that it only re-injects some of the time because there's no way to force the first pass through to hit one of the re-injecting wraparound wires. Um, but that's okay. Um, that puts a irregularity into the system. Some of the time it's once through or once in a reflection, and sometimes it's once in a reflection and then re-injected and wrap around la-di-da, and that that will make it harder uh, to cryptanalyze the rotor system. So I think that's okay. The, um, so last month, IEEE Spectrum published this paper, The Scandalous History of the Last Rotor Cipher Machine, how this gadget figured in the shady Rubicon spy case, which is what we discussed last year. Uh, Crypto AG, the Higlin company, had rediscovered the reinjection principle and the secret U.S. patent granted to Army Signals wasn't noticed as blocking prior art, so they were actually allowed to get a U.S. patent which tipped off NSA's Friedman, who went racing over to Zug, Switzerland, and said, you can't do this. This would be as secure as our KL-7, and that would be a problem. This was Higlin's only second attempt at a rotor as opposed to a pinwheel machine. Uh, and... He, it, uh, it, it got killed. It got killed so fast, only 12 of them were built. Apparently, two survive. There's an auction record for one, and this article discusses the discovery and uh, refit, repair, um, of a second. Were the other 10 destroyed? Are they in private collections? Are they in government hands? Uh, it's quite possible that uh, a couple of the cryptography museums have a couple. I haven't checked their inventories, so maybe there are a few more known. Um, now you can see in the picture, uh, there are a bunch of rotors in the middle here. 
Um, there are a bunch of uh, big number rotary switches in the back that uh, control the reflector and various other things uh, that, that cover the sort of replace the Enigma secker board, uh, the plug board. Uh, it prints out uh, on sticky paper strips both the enciphered and the plain text. And cute little machine. Only 12 of them. And some websites claim that the Russian Fialka, which is sort of their equivalent of the Sigaba and the Type X, but also sort of their equivalent of the KL7, uh, had reinjection. But based on circuit diagrams I've looked at over the last few days, no. It may have had security roughly equivalent to and is a final transitional rotor machine, but it does not appear to actually have reinjection because it only has 30 pins on its rotors uh, for 33 Cyrillic letters. There are no extra pins to do reinjection. In fact, they're having to get a few of the rarer Cyrillic letters handled in shift to um, numbers mode, uh, shift to figures. So, yeah, uh, I don't think it's uh, reinjecting. Interestingly, though, um, because they'd been able to attack some of our cipher machines by monitoring the uh, electrical power jacks in our embassies, uh, they had feedback from their Fialka to the power supply to um, modulate the uh, uh, power drawn from the wall to compensate for lower power demand. The... Uh, so that there was no signal being released onto the line. This is the equivalent to uh, a modern uh, hardware, software cipher uh, having constant time of execution of each step of the encipherment of a letter. So you can't tell by watching the speed of encipherment or decipherment what the key letters are. Uh, equivalent problem. And the Russians had that figured out while they were listening to us. Thank you, guys. But the, the websites that say this is reinjecting, I think, are wrong. Um, but I'm covering it here since some places say that it is, uh, and it is late transitional. Um, hello? Hello? Oh, I tried to page down in the uh, Jitsi meeting instead of in the uh, slide. That didn't work well. The earlier uh, American reinjection machine, which was shared with the Brits, at least somewhat, uh, was the KL7, also known as Pollux Adonis, also known as AFSAM7. The Brits called it BID60 Singlet, uh, had 10 rotors. Um, 26 letters and 10 reinjection contacts, which is why you have blank spots between Z and A and between B and C um, on the uh, rotors. You've got 10 extra contacts on each rotor wheel, uh, which is so there is some that's where you have the extra space for uh, the feedback loops. But that means that there's only a one third chance that it's going to feed back on. Uh, as opposed to just directly outputting. But that's enough to mess things up, so that's good. This system being supposedly invulnerable to Bletchley Park-style cryptanalysis is why the Soviets had the Walker ring um, steal the 
key sequences being used to set up the machines and issued the walker ring with um, pocket decoders that could read out what the internal wiring of the rotors were. So you had Walker Navy men, I hope they're not cousins, um, going into the code room and going through the wheels that weren't currently in the machine, reading out all um, 36 mappings for each of the wheels that wasn't in the machine and sending those to their Soviet handlers. Thanks, guys. And the uh, after accurate Java and C++ simulations were published, the system was completely declassified. You can get a, uh, a full set of schematics on the web today, uh, which is you know, moder moderately quick turnaround. Um, I could, since uh, we got through that fairly quickly, I'm just going to bring up the uh, um, IEEE uh, article, and we scroll through that because that'll give us more view of the HX63, which... This is the IEEE article by John D. Paul. He says he grew up in New York City and wanted to be a spy. Um, he found in a dingy sub-basement in a French military communications base the uh, Yes, John, I'll, I'll, I'll post the link over here so you can follow along, but I will also uh, be sending you a full set of all the links for everything uh, after the meeting so you can post it in the notes section. The, um, and in the interest of history, the uh, nice French two-star generals um, let him take this antique machine and... Uh, rehabilitated as an antique because it was completely useless since it had never really been in production use. There were only 12 of them. Um, the French only had two of them. Um, and anything they'd sent by it was, you know, obsolete. Who cares? Um, so there it was. And he's got a, he did a nice little video where he uh, describes the fun of repairing it. Um, Now, I really need to be trying to scroll the window. And here is what it looks like with the skin off. Looking at the underside here, cast aluminum base. You can see the connectors at the bottom. Use 9 of 12 rotors at a time. You can... See, they nest. So they solved the problem of the pins by having the pins be horizontal um, and mating face-to-face -face instead of sliding around each other um, the way Enigma pins did. Breakthrough. Only done once. Uh, a picture of William Friedman. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here, here's his picture of um, how a simple non-reflecting enigma would have gone through once. In reality, it went back through from the reflector and showing the side-to-side -side face pins instead of the uh, radial face pins of this machine. Here's a picture of the rotors in place. 
And here's a detailed picture of how the HX63 would do reinjection. Keyboard injects at one of the 26 letter positions. It gets scrambled through the rotors going through, gets reflected back um, letter to letter. Um, and then if it comes out on one of the 10 non letter positions, it gets reinjected back in. Er, I'm sorry, gray, it gets reinjected back around to a second reflection, wrap around, which then should reflect back through. There are some subtleties here that uh, I would like more information on. Um, and th this was just threatening to the NSA, which is why they had it suppressed and paid handsomely to have it suppressed. So that's uh, that's that. And you should be seeing me again. So questions? We see a PR. Unmute yourself or use the chat. Sorry, you're seeing BR in a purple circle? Not purple, kind of the um, reddish moon purple. Uh, not the, the system tells me I'm sending my face. Well, I'm not seeing your face. I'm uh, just seeing the initials in the colored circle. Well, that doesn't really hurt anything on the video because my face is not important. I can see your face. I can see my face. But anyway, questions? Or this isn't so much a question as a comment. Yes, Randy, I turned the slides off because the slides are over. Did anybody see the IEEE article after I turned the slides off? Oh, yeah, I saw the article. Okay, good. And you saw everything that was important. Yeah, I can hear with Jerry. I've also seen that gray circle that's a good loss. Huh. The, the, uh, Yeah, I've got a connection lost on you. I can hear you, but I can't yeah. see you. It says to me that I've got 2.3 megabits per second up. So I don't know. But it says frame rate NA. You'd think it would give a frame rate if it was video. Uh, now you're pretty sure. Whatever. Uh, anyway, questions? Now you're green. Jerry, you're muted. Actually, I wasn't muted. That's better. You wanted to say something, Jerry? No. Uh, you're, came, you're green now. Your connection is... It says you're unmuted, but I'm not hearing you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. It's just stupid. I hear him. We seem to be getting inconsistent results. Uh, that we didn't get yeah. Very. Okay, I'm unmuted.
You've got a good connection right now. Uh, I definitely want to go back to using Cat six instead of uh, five gigahertz for my uh, video sharing device next time. I'm Wi-Fi here because I'm in a rental unit. I didn't want to run wires all over the place. I reconnected again. Wonder if I can hear Jerry now. Say something, Jerry, would you? Okay, I'm saying something. Can you yes, hear me? I, yes, I can hear you. Good. Yeah, I reset my uh, Wi Fi. Uh, Antenna. And I, I reset my connection with Jitsi. So were you yeah. trying to ask a question to begin with or just commenting on my circle? Commenting on your circle. Oh, okay. Does anybody have a substantive question? Oh, let me see my way. Most people are still muted. The cameras are up. So there's no way of telling how many people fell asleep. <laughs> oh, there's only one person that I've got a screen capture of their nodding off while their camera was on. Being saved as blackmail. Blake Parker used to bring in a uh, water pistol. Jabber used to nod off during our meetings. Traditional in the old Puritan churches was the ushers had a pole with a feather at one end and a wooden knob at the other. Uh, deacons, they would tickle with the feather. Anyone else, they'd bonk with the knob. Their sermons ran two hours and the services four, so this was a very real problem. Does anyone know who Kurt with a C was? He's been around before. We had uh, dual Kurt's frequently. Yeah, Kurt with a C. That's um. Can't remember his last name off the top of my head. But Bill, you say he's you know, a regular at our meetings. You know, you know for sure we've had multiple Kurt's with a C. No, we've had Kurt with a C and Kurt with a K frequently when you know who is doing hardware yep i, I checked your mailing list stuff for kurt with a c and i couldn't find one kurt, kurt with a k knows he can ask me questions offline and maybe expecting the time shift with youtube yeah, when i post the text in the chat uh, i like to uh, go into people's names uh, the name isn't fully uh, spelled out. Uh, when you see. But there's always a bunch yeah, of but we can barely hear you. That might be a feature. Yep. And so there are always a handful of names where I don't know who they are. So I have to put them at the bottom of it, just like, like anonymous uh, attendees. And since, since links in a uh, presentation document are difficult to deal with, I've got a separate uh, markdown file of all the links and an uh, HTML generated from that that uh, you can include in the notes, Jabber. 
has all the goodies. Including where to get a declassified NSA textbook. I always look to save a cash copy locally on the website. Oh, obviously. And you, you might want to go through parts one and two before tackling part three. It's the advanced class. Question, you may as well call tonight. And we have Federico next month. Uh, oh, good. And he's also going to speak in January for his uh, scale. Uh, we still need to find someone for November and someone for December. Let's just probably can kill the stream. Do I hear the stream, Jerry? What? I can't hear you. I said, do you want to stop the live stream? Okay, we'll do that. <laughs> 